8, verses 28 through 34. We'll close up this chapter this morning. You know, our past may torment us, but its pains should not keep us in chains. All of us have situations that took place in our past. But those situations should not keep us in chains for our future. We need to grow through those things. We need to learn and we need to let go of those things and move forward with what God has for us. Otherwise, we become useless. We're stagnant. We're not doing the things that God has called us to do. But deal with those things first. Jesus has come to set us free. Jesus has come to set us free. He has come to give us freedom and liberty. He has come so that we have peace and rest. That's the whole purpose for Jesus coming. Because Jesus is concerned about us. And, and John is clear when he says that. Therefore, if the Son make you free, you shall be free indeed and so if the son has come into your life then you are free from the things that hold men last time we met we ended up in verse 25 where his disciples came to him they woke him up because he was at the stern of the boat during this great tempest and they began to scream out we're perishing don't you care and he stood up and he rebuked them by saying why are you fearful oh you of little faith and then he arose and rebuked the wind and the sea and then there was a great calm that's exactly what jesus does he comes and he calms our storms and we are to have faith that's the application we are to trust him we are to know that he has our best interests and even if we're in the midst of the storm jesus will be with us in that midst so we saw his power over nature here and now we're going to see his authority his authority over the spiritual host. Matthew is presenting Jesus as a king. And as a king, he has his pedigree, his genealogy. And the angels came, not with trumpets, as a king probably would be introduced, but the angels came and announced Jesus as the Messiah of the world. And Matthew has been proving throughout the chapters that we've been going through that Jesus has authority, that he has power over nature and now over the spiritual host we have our first account of an exorcism in the gospel of matthew we don't hear a lot about exorcisms anymore unless it's on some movie that's coming out you know, like the exorcist or the exorcist 2 or exorcist 3 or exorcist 4 you know one of those movies that talk about demon possessions we don't really hear a lot about that though jesus is going to deal with it this is probably one of the most detailed description of demonic possession that we have in the bible and yet the focus isn't really on the demonic possession it's more on jesus's love for the men that are possessed by the demons but yet it does give us great details on how demons work and Hollywood has it pretty much right on. They must have read this passage uh, because some of the, the, the movies portrayed uh, demonic forces very, very accurately as in the scriptures. And we'll see that as we go through this r really quickly. So Christ is going to drive out these demons into pigs. I feel sorry for the pigs. Poor Wilbur. Can you imagine poor Wilbur? You know, walking in our backyard and then some demon enters. He's already a little demon devil. You know, he gets into everything. He's chasing you. He was chasing my mother-in-law the other day and he's got this loud, ar, 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 and you think he's going to bite you. You know, and I'm, I'm scared of him. I have to go and rub his big fat belly and he kind of lays on the side and he moves a little bit more so you get him on the other side. But if you kind of slap him on the rump, you know, just like this, you go, ar, 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 and he jumps up and he looks at you like he's going to attack you. You know, I feel sorry for the pigs because they get filled with this demonic uh, legion that Jesus casts into them. Let's go ahead and read the text. And I want to point out a couple of things as we read the text that you might want to highlight. So if you have a highlighter, go ahead and pull it out or a pen of some sort and, and underline these things. Look at verse 28. It says, When he had come to the other side, to the country of the Gardenes, there met him two demon-possessed men. So I highlighted that because I think that's important. 
I think that the focus is going to be on these men and on the townspeople and on his disciples. So I highlighted the importance of these two men who were demon-possessed. Coming out of the tomb exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a good day or, or a good way off from them there was a herd of many swine feeding. So the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, permit us to go away into the herds of swine. Now I highlighted that because I think it's interesting that these demons had to ask permission from Jesus to be cast into these swines. Uh, they couldn't just do what they wanted to do. Uh, Jesus had to give them the permission to do that. And he said to them, Go. So when they had come out, they went into the herd of swines, and suddenly the whole herd of swines ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished in the water. Then those who kept them fled. Now, I highlighted that also because there are bystanders watching this. These are the people that kept the pigs uh, who are they? Why are they keeping pigs? Are they Gentiles? Are they Jews? Uh, they're part of this scenario. Jesus is trying to reach their hearts also. And they went away into the city and told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to depart from their, genera from their region. Now, I highlighted they begged him to depart, kind of unusual. You see a miracle or hear of a miracle like this, and, and the first thing you do is you beg him to leave, not beg him to come in, but you, ex you ex excuse him from your territory instead of inviting him as a king into your territory and as a great man. And so we're going to focus on those three things this morning. We do have a parallel account uh, of this story in Mark chapter 5. 1 through 20, and also Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. If you want to read them today sometime uh, this evening or so on your Sabbath day. Um, interesting that Matthew does mention the two de demons here, where Mark and Luke only mention one. Doesn't mean there's an error. Jesus is focusing on two. Mark and Luke are just focusing on the one demon. We will see two tormented men under the control of demons here this morning. Also, a city under the control of sin itself and the authority of Christ over the demonic world. Today, we see so many theories about ghosts, uh, whether they're through movies, whether through television, whether through stories or sitcoms, whatever it is, we, we hear the stories of ghosts. And, and you always hear the question, are there such thing as ghosts? Do ghosts live in homes? We were talking about the, man, uh, the mission inn over here. And, and some of us were, were talking about how there's ghosts that live in the mission inn. You know, are there such things as ghosts? I don't believe there are. I don't believe that they are. I believe the scriptures are clear, clear that there are demons and that demons have been around, as Isaiah tells us, when Satan stands before God and wanting to be like the most high God. When we see in Job uh, that Satan and his demons are walking to and fro in heaven before the Lord and then the Lord gives him permission to, to um, bring suffering to Job and his family. But ghosts, as far as human beings... Uh, leaving this earth and then coming back to haunt a place? I don't believe so. Demons have been around for thousands and thousands of years. God created them before us in the heavenly realms, the Bible tells us. And so if they were there with God and then they were cast down to the earth with Satan and then they tempted Adam and Eve and then the, the earth populated, they've been watching the whole thing firsthand. Now, where are they watching from? I don't know. Whether it's another dimension, whether they're in a spiritual body form and we can't see them. Daniel chapter 9 is very clear that there's a battle going on in the spiritual realm, even with our prayers going up to the Father in heaven. And so they could be here now. And you see uh, many pictures that are uh, picted with men on their knees or struggling to things, and you see angels fighting demons all around him. You know, and that may be the picture of uh, the demonic realm. Uh, Paul makes a reference to it in Ephesians, how we don't fight against or wrestle against uh, you know, uh, fleshly things, but against powers and principalities of the air. 
And so there's something to be said about demons who have been around for a long time and who know us. If they've been around since my birth and they know my grandfather and my grandmother and they know their grandfather and grandmother and so forth. So it would be easy for them (coughs) to send someone into the home and pretend to be gramps and haunt the place, you know, and confuse society and the world that there's ghosts and not demons as the bible says Let, let's let's take the focus off what the word says and let's put the focus on something else there's ghosts we have grandma coming back because she was disgruntled and something happened until she finds some sort of resolve then she'll leave the place and we have a, have to exercise her from someone or or so forth so and we hear all those those stories remember what jesus said in matthew six thirteen. But deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever and ever. There is an evil one. And and the whole purpose of God is to deliver us from him. Now, what is he doing? He is attacking the world. He is attacking society. He is attacking individuals. And he's keeping them from Jesus Christ. And so Jesus has come to protect us from that evil one, to deliver us from that evil one. And Jesus will deliver these two men who are possessed by Satan to reveal his great love for them. Now, you have to remember, Jesus was what? In Capernaum. He told the disciples, get into the boat. And we saw this demonic storm come up, so fierce, so great that it almost destroyed them all. And now they're there in Gardenian, in the land there on the mountainside, the... um, east side of the lake of Galilee and they're stopped by these two men who are possessed again by demons and so that's one reason that I believe the storm was demonic also and so Jesus is forcing his way to this community to deliver these two men so they become a testimony of his power and his authority but also that that city uh, would stand in judgment because of their rejection of him and not receiving him so this morning I've themed it liberated, liberated. Have you been liberated? You know what liberated means? You've been set free, like a weight has been taken off of you. If you're weighted down, if you feel weighted down from sin, if you feel weighted down from struggles and trials and things that are going on in your life, you know, we were just talking earlier with, with uh, a brother and the, the weight of just thanksgiving. You know, Thanksgiving can be a great time, right? A family, you enjoy the turkey and the stuffing, or it can be a a time of arguing and fighting too. It can be a time of stress. Uh, I've seen both. There have been times where my family has, and I'm talking about my personal family, my wife and I and the boys have just been like on cloud nine. And it was like, wow, you can't get a better Thanksgiving than this. And then there's been those times where like, why did I even come, <laughs> you know? It's like, what is going on? Because we're flesh, we're humans. We can't let go. We have a burden. And sometimes we release that burden at the wrong times and wrong places. I'm not saying I'm not guilty in that at all. I'm not saying that at all. But we have burdens and God wants to liberate us from those burdens. And isn't that the challenge in our life on a daily basis? Lord, help us today. <sighs> help me with the things that I have to deal with. Help me with my own flesh, with my own problems, Lord. Give me some freedom here, some space. Uh, Take this uh, yoke from me, and let me take your yoke, Lord. So let's go ahead and and look at uh, three points here, as I mentioned earlier. When he had come to the other side of the country of the Gardeans, uh, there met him two demon-possessed men. So first point, Listen to what I'm saying here. His focus is not on these demonic forces. His focus is on these two men and the townspeople. That's his focus. He's there for them. The demonic realm is there. He created the angels in heaven. He knows how they are and he knows where they're going and he knows you know, what he needs to do. So his focus is for these two men. That's his focus. That's his aim. No other thing. Uh, he has to deal with those things, but... He's dealing with those things to get to their hearts. And that's important for us to understand because Jesus is more concerned about the men and the townspeople than he is about the demons, than the things that surround them. Like the storm. 
Oh yeah, there's a storm, but I'm sleeping in the back. Don't worry about that. I'm worried about your faith. I'm worried about your strength. I'm worried about your weaknesses. I'm worried about you as my disciples because greater things are you going to encounter later on in the future when I'm gone. And now you have to depend on the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you. And so I want you to be strong enough to battle against those things. You know, when my boys were, were growing up, um, just knowing these things in the scriptures, I would uh, allow them to go through things or I would even put them through things without them knowing. And I would tell them, you're, you're stronger than that. You're greater than that. You don't have to give in to that. And, and my purpose was for that is to make them strong so that when they get older, they're able to deal with things. And I think that it worked because <laughs> the enemy has thrown some pretty horrific things at them and they're still here. They're hanging on with a string, some of them, but they're still here. And, and it's the strength of the Lord and their ability to understand that they need the Lord even more than ever before. And that goes for all of us, for all of us. God allows these things in our lives to strengthen us. So Jesus is here for you. He's here for you to give you strength, to give you power, to give you what you need at that moment to endure what you're going through. And there are experiences that may haunt you from your past that you have to deal with, but Jesus is here to give you victory. And it's vital always to reflect upon the sacrifice of Jesus for humanity, to remind us that he loves us and cares about us. You look to the cross. He paid a great price for you because he loved you. I was reading an article <clears throat> by a writer who gave five points about Jesus' love. I just want to share two that they were pretty um, profound. Uh, one point is that love does not discriminate or require prerequisites. Love does not discriminate. doesn't matter who you are, what you've done. doesn't discriminate. God's love is there for you. <clears throat> you know, it's there for you, and it's there for the person you think that it shouldn't be there for. That love is there for them too. Uh, or requires prerequisites. Or requires prerequisites. Jesus, this is what he said, Jesus gravitated to the margins of society and spent significant time with those who were considered the fringe of culture. He did not center his attention on the most powerful, popular, or polished. Jesus did not place a standard on the kinds of people he would love and care for. In fact, if he did have bias, it was towards those who were ignorant discarded and unvalued and you look at the life of jesus and that's who he went for for those that no one else went for for the leopard who was down in the town for the woman that had an issue of blood for 12 men who were the lowest in society fishermen <clears throat> tax collectors who were hated i mean jesus could have went right to the source nicodemus and the pharisees hey i'm here the messiah let's get this done and they would have raised him up but he didn't his love was for humanity his second point care is not just talk care is not just talk it must be tangible for a person to care he can't just say i care i care for you i love you man he has to show that he loves you. He has to have tangible evidence. How does this community know that we love them? I could stand from this pulpit and say, we just love the community. We need to reach it every Sunday. Well, that's not love. The love is hosting a summer fest and giving out everything for free to the community, no matter who they are. That's love. That's a tangible evidence of that love. Now, you may not think so, and you might think, well, he just says it. Oh, yeah, we did that thing, but it, he really doesn't love them. No, that's the evidence that we love them. The evidence that we put on a Thanksgiving uh, luncheon for the community and, and just welcomed whoever came in. Uh, we, we, have, we had individuals that belong to this community right in this area here that we see all the time that have have disrupted this church from time to time because of their addictions and so forth and yet we still received them in we fed them we loved them that's evidence that we care about them don't don't believe the lie of the enemy don't believe the lie of the enemy because someone in someone uh makes a mistake and doesn't do something exactly the way you think Oh, they're not a loving person. 
And yet they go out and they do all these things, tangible things to love people. That's the evidence that they love. They're not perfect and we're not perfect, but we have the tangible evidence that we love this community, that you love this community. So talk is cheap. Uh, and Jesus would probably be the first one to say talk is cheap. Uh, he did not spend time or his time talking about how compassionate he was. Jesus embodied love in this world in a way that always considered the physical and spiritual needs of the people. I mean, there was even a point, you remember, when the children were coming to him and the disciples were like, hey, get them away from them. No, don't forbid the little ones to come unto me. Because he had tangible love that you could measure. And so when you see someone that has that type of love, acknowledge that. Don't let the enemy come in and, and disturb you from acknowledging the fact that this is a church that loves. And when you see that tangible evidence, acknowledge it. Jesus embodied the love, embodied love in this world in a way uh, that considered and always considered the physical and spiritual needs of people. While it may be nice to tell about others about your hearts for compassion via platforms like Twitter, Facebook, it's ultimately your action that provides care for the people. Uh, there's, um, on Facebook, there's a page that someone made up, and it's Acts of Kindness in Harupa Valley. And you can go on there, and people will post uh, acts of kindness, whether someone else uh, did something or whether they did something, and they'll po post these acts of kindness. And I think they're really acts of kindness because the evidence, the tangible things that they're doing. Now, yes, and I'll acknowledge that, that we can be doing things with the wrong heart and for the wrong reasons. And we have to correct those things. But Jesus is our example of what love is for humanity. He's more concerned about you than about the demons. So they're coming out of this tomb. Uh, some have described it as a square uh, box of two rooms um, that just house people and these demons are in there. And they're exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass that way. Now, one evidence of, uh, of demon possession is that they're fierce. Uh, they're angry. They're mad. They're screaming and yelling. So this depiction of demons who come out and they're, ah, you know, that's true. They, they scare you. And they're in this tomb and, and people are walking along the road and they jump out and like, ah, you know. There's this thing on Facebook right now that people are doing where you're watching some little uh, clip and it says, watch, watch, watch for the boat right now. And then you're watching at the boat and then all of a sudden this picture of this this ugly mask comes out and starts screaming at you and you go oh because you didn't expect that to happen and so they just kind of shock you with this and it's all a a joke you know i don't know if you've seen those or not um but they're hilarious afterwards you go oh so now you're expecting it every time well that's what these demons did they were in their tomb and they just jump out at you and so they jump out at jesus and they're fierce and they're uh, they're in the way and they're keeping people from passing by I believe there's more demon possessions uh, that we're not aware of that still happen today. We don't hear a lot about it, but I really think that a lot of uh, the disorders, the psychological disorders that we see in children, and if you see documentaries on some of these kids, not on all of them, and I have to be careful of that because I'm not going to say your child's demon possessed, you know, but uh, uh, when you look at some of this stuff, you, you see some of the characteristics of the voices, of the jumping up and down, of, of just various things when you see some of these documentaries uh, about children. And then you go to third world countries and you see these uh, <coughs> natives who are practicing voodoo and, and, and witchcraft and various things like this that bring up and conjure um, demonic forces also. Uh, the murders, the rapes that are going on in, in with the terrorist groups, the Muslims, and you see them how, and how so callously they, they, they rape the women and they behead them and then they rape the children and the, and the young girls and they marry them and pass them. I mean, that, that's got to be demonic. It's got to be demonic. And so I think there's more demonic uh, activity happening today than ever before. And so it says in verse 29, suddenly they cried out saying, what have we to do with you? Or, or literally it means what to us and you, Jesus, son of God. They knew Jesus. Demons know who God is. Jesus knows who you are. He, they know you. They've been around for a long time. 
Have you come to torment us? They understood that there was a torment coming, that judgment was coming. And of course, they said before the time, because the time's not yet, they understood there was a time frame to take place uh, when God would judge them and sent them into uh, the abyss, in a sense. They don't know the day, but they're wondering, is this the time? Or have you judged us before the time, Jesus? And again, they acknowledge him as the Son of God. You know, James, and we see that reference, you believe that there's one God, and you believe, well, but the demons believe it also, and they fear and they tremble at that day. Very real. Have you come here to torment us before the time? Uh, <clears throat> verse 30, now... A good way off from them, there was a herd of many swines. Now, some believe that because they're swines, that this must have been a, a, a community of non-Jews, Gentiles, because Gentiles had swines. Um, and so it's dealing with Gentiles here. But we know that Jesus really didn't go to the Gentiles first. He went to the Jews first, to the house of Israel. And so I really believe that he's coming here uh, to minister to the tribe of Israel, the tribe of Gad and Reuben. When you go back to the Old Testament, you remember that they were to take the promised land. Now listen to this because it's this something you may not, never have heard. Uh, when, when, when the 12 tribes went into the land of Canaan, they began to overtake it. But you remember there was a situation crossing the Jordan where Reuben and Gad decided that they were going to stay on the other side and they weren't, they weren't going to go with them. They would help them and they helped them but then they went back, and you remember that the other tribes thought that they were retreating and they weren't going to help, so they started to attack them and said, whoa, 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 no, we'll help you, but we just want to stay here. Well, it's those tribes that stayed there that are the ancestors of these people here in Gardene. And so they're Jewish, and now they're finding themselves in, in the um, retail business or market of pigs and swines. They're doing the work of Gentiles, which was unlawful for them to do. They weren't following uh, Moses' commands. And so they were a city that were living under sin. And Jesus is coming for them. And so the demons begged him, saying, now uh, that tells me here that they, they, they're literally under an emotional stress here. So these demons do have some sort of sensation and feelings. And they're like really scared. And, and, and as James said, they're, they, they're in terror you know, we're begging you, please, send us into, don't send us where we're supposed to go yet. Send us into the swines. If you cast us out, permit us to go into the herd of swines. Now, again, another observation is that demons can enter into animals as well as humans. So... I don't know. I don't think Wilbur's demon possessed he's a he's a nice little pig you can come up to if you're virginia you can come up to him and just have him lay in your lap and just cuddle with him he just loves you with his big old fang teeth and everything it's hard to see him uh in, in a place like this but apparently they can um through the permission of of jesus here now whether they need permission all the time it doesn't say but in this case jesus gave them permission to be cast into these um pigs so my second point here is that that jesus has authority over, over every sphere of existence uh, that's power when you think about it uh, he has to give permission and, and so when when we read the scripture in first john 4 4 uh, where john tells us um you are of god first of all you're of god you are children of god little children he says and so that is you've given your heart to him and and he's in you now, and so you have inherited uh, that uh, relationship with him as children, dear children, loving, caring children. And so he's given you then uh, the ability and power to overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And so because as dear children he comes and resides in you, he then gives you the power to overcome any demonic forces and we use this scripture as evidence that demons cannot possess christians because we're filled with the holy spirit and, and good and evil can't dwell together good and evil battle each other but they don't dwell with each other and so because we're filled we've overcome the evil one we can first recognize him study this passage and you'll recognize a demonic force 
Um, I've talked to people who have been demon-possessed. I know people who um, are living with demon-possessed people. And I've heard stories of people who have dealt with demon-possessed people and how they've had to exercise those uh, demons from those people. And you do it very carefully, prayerfully, uh, in the name of Jesus and not in our own authority. But we have this power within us that Jesus uh, has over all of the spheres of existence. Uh, You look at Job and you see that without God's permission, uh, he was not able to take the life of Job himself. It was a limit there, though he gave him permission to do anything else. And so Job's children and all his wealth were taken from him, but all under the control of God. Now, you might be thinking, well, why would God allow that, though? Why would God allow that? And that's something that I can't tell you. I'm not God. There's a greater purpose there. God didn't do it, just like God didn't have this hatred for animals that he would cast demons into pigs because he doesn't like animals. You know, it, it works through his his plans and his purpose. But you can draw that out if, if you're a person that starts really looking at it and coming up with its thoughts when that's not the focus of what the scriptures are talking about. Well, God must hate animals because he threw them into the swines. Why would he do that? What kind of God would throw demons into swines? Come on, I mean, that's the God you want. You know what? You can do that with anything, you know, with anything. God is more concerned for the men, and you forget that. And, and that's the problem with the church sometimes. When we start nitpicking all, we well, look at the way he said this, and look at what he did there. Man, you know what? There's work to be done. Stop it. Let's start looking and focusing on people out there that need Jesus and get them saved, because otherwise we're just wasting our times like those two little mice in the, in the wheel that are just running around all over the place. You know, stop it. Come on, focus on the real thing, and that is those two men in that town that Jesus is trying to reach. <clears throat> These demons could not bear the thought of being sent to a place where they would spend eternity, at least before the time. Uh, so they asked to be cast into demons. And he said to them, go. Uh, so when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine, and suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down Uh, the steep place into the sea and perished uh, in the water there. Then those who kept them fled and they went away into the city and told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Um, And behold, the whole city came to meet Jesus. And that's his purpose. That was his plan right there, right? The purpose was to, to get their attention. These two men... These two men are possessed, they're tormented, they're screaming, they're yelling, uh, they're upsetting um, commerce there in the market, uh, they're scaring people, and Jesus comes and sets them free. That's a good thing. Uh, The people see this, and they go back and tell everything to everyone else, and they come out, and now Jesus has an audience. And so now he has an audience to preach the gospel to them. And they come out, and they don't even want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. Look what you did to our swine. <laughs> you know, that's what they're going to say. Leave us, you know, in, in a sense. Just think, they had the Messiah standing before them. They had the King of kings and the Lord of lords. They had the miracle worker, the healer of diseases, and yet they asked him to, to leave. And when they saw this, they begged him, depart from this region, depart from this region. It's Like, wow, they missed it right there. And how we miss it because we're, Worried about the pigs. There's a story, a true story about a girl who had no room for Jesus. She had apparently gone grocery shopping and uh, done uh, some other things and had groceries in her trunk, uh, some eggs and other stuff and whatever she had purchased and so forth. And this girl was asked um, why she uh, did not have Jesus in her life. And she basically said, that she doesn't have enough room for him in her life. Can you imagine saying that? I don't have enough room for Jesus. I know we can understand that. But for the world, it's easy for them to, to say, I, I got too many things to do in this world. I don't have room enough for him in my life, except, and this is what she said, except in the trunk of my car. 
Uh, I mean, that's where I would have Jesus in the trunk of my car. How many of us have Jesus in the trunk of our car? You know, we, we keep him somewhere else and not in our lives, in a part of our lives. Well, apparently she was killed in a car accident. And her trunk was untouched. Even the eggs were fine. That's where Jesus was. Imagine telling Jesus, get lost. Get lost. We're more into pigs than into Jesus. Right? We're more into the things of this world than into the things of God. <clears throat> We're more into what's going on in society and the culture and the United States than we are of what's going on in the church and what the church is doing. And we don't need him right now. We don't want him right now. And so Jesus left. I mean, he's, he's a perfect gentleman. He's not going to pressure or... or do anything to anyone that doesn't want it to be done to him and so he left because you just wiped out our pigs you wiped out our prophet my livelihood how many of us would give up jesus if all of a sudden we lost our jobs and people do or our cars or our relationships this is where you got to get tough where you have to know what you believe and you hang on no matter what it's a sad moment when people ask the lord to depart third point and we'll close here we see a city under the control of sin under the control of sin they're more involved with the sin than with the savior they're more into their livelihood than with god's kingdom they're more into selfishness than unselfishness in John chapter 8, Jesus answered the religious leaders, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. If we commit sin, then we're the slaves of sin. And so he likens our sins as masters, and that we are the slaves of that sin, whatever that sin may be. And it could be pride arrogance it could it could be sexual sin it could be any kind of sin and it becomes the master of us and we become its slave now we're a slave to whatever it is we serve and so we can be a slave to sin or we can be a slave to god and that's why i really believe that serving god is so important in the body of christ because it gets us off it gets our minds off of ourself it puts our minds on others it helps us to Stop thinking about our life and thinking about other people's lives. Let me read to you what Spurgeon said about the slaves of sin. He says, a little thorn may cause much suffering. Isn't that true? You ever get a goat head? Man, those things hurt. I hate goat heads. That's why I round up my my yard and even the church, because you guys would get them in, in your tires, the goat heads. We used to get, have them here a lot. But I know what they look like now, and so as soon as they start forming, pss, I spray them. Just kill those suckers. Because, man, those goat heads get into your, your skin, and it's like, ow, how can something so little hurt so bad? Good, they're probably a good reason for calling them goat heads. Thus, they look like a goat, but they're demonic, you know, almost. <laughs> So he recognized that a little thorn may cease or cause much suffering. A little cloud may hide the sun. Uh, little foxes spoil the vines. And little sins do mischief to the tender heart. These little sins burl in the soul and make it so full of that which it is which is hateful to Christ, that he will hold no comfortable fellowship and communion with us. A great sin cannot destroy a Christian, but a little sin can make him miserable. Think about that for a second as I read that. Isn't it the little sins that make us miserable? The little things that we're dealing with? It's like you can't sleep, you're thinking about it. Like, okay, Lord, just take me home. It's like, why do I have to deal with this, Lord? Why does it got to be in my life, Lord? But it's there. And you can't get rid of it. It's like having a tail, and it just kind of hits you so, and you're like, get, you know, you're pushing it away, and like, man, if I could just cut it off. But you can't. You can't. And it's that little sin that makes you so miserable. It's like that little thorn. 
just poking you all the time. And we all have it. And if you say you don't, then you don't know yourself. <laughs> and like John says, and you're a liar because you, you say you have no sin, but yet you do. It's a little sin. And it makes you miserable and it makes others miserable too. And because then you come in grumpy. And then they're grumpy. And then you have a Thanksgiving that's grumpy instead of Thanksgiving, full of Thanksgiving. You saw those two ladies that were fighting over a gift uh, Black Friday. And they were attacking each other, you know, holding on to each other. And then they, a little kid had the package and they threw it, took it away from the kid, you know. That's the stuff that just causes turmoil all the time in our lives. Look at the turmoil in your life. Look at the misery in your life. And I'll bet you, you can tie it into sin. I bet you you can tie it with sin. Guarantee you tie it with sin. And if you can acknowledge that and let that sin go, then God will give you that peace. He goes on and says, Christians, what has thou to do with sin? Has it not cost thee enough already? Burnt child, will thou play with fire? What? When thou has already been between the jaws of the lion, will thou step a second time into his den? Has thou not had enough of the old serpent when we get tired of it? And God does bring you to a point where he reveals it and kind of brings it to the surface and you keep dealing with it and you're miserable. And then finally he says, you know, you need to get rid of it. You need to let it go. And it takes time sometimes with people. And sometimes it takes uh, drastic things that God brings into your life uh, where everyone knows, and now he's dealing with it, and now you're finally letting it go. You know? And he may not have brought it to that point because he's still giving you the opportunity to let it go and move on. Turn to Romans 6. <clears throat> Had a couple of scriptures, but I'll, I'll share this one. I think it's important. I'm uh, hoping to go through the book of Romans uh, after we're done with... Uh, Matthew. <clears throat> it's right after the book of Acts 6.15. It's a great chapter that talks about sin. <clears throat> Let's just go ahead and, and, and read it because at the end, if you look at verse 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life to Christ Jesus our Lord. And so the, the, the whole point of this passage here 15 through 23 is to remind us that sin just brings death and, and misery but jesus brings a life uh, to our souls he says what then uh, paul as he writes to romans shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace and people think that way oh i'm under grace now so i can continue to sin and he goes certainly not do you not know that to whom you present yourselves to obey you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin to death or of obedience to righteousness. And so either we're letting God be our master or we're letting sin be our master. Now these people let the pigs and, and, and Gentiles' laws be their masters instead of God being their master. But God, but God be thanked that through you, though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. And that's my point right there. Becoming slaves of righteousness. What does that mean? That now you allow God to be your master and you become slaves. That means you serve righteousness. Righteousness are our acts towards humanity, our acts towards God. And so when we have an opportunity like serving thanksgiving and I, i'm not condemning anyone here please don't get that uh, if you weren't here that's fine but you have this opportunity we should look at it as an opportunity to serve righteousness right we're serving righteousness because god is our master and we're serving righteousness so the more we serve the more we're serving our master and we're not serving our sin and that's when sin lessens and that's why i love being in church that's why i love being here and now that I'm feeling better, I'm here on Tuesdays now uh, in the morning. Uh, I wasn't in the past, but now I'm trying to get here on Tuesday mornings. Just trying to stay busy with God's things so that I don't sin as much. Trying to become a slave of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves 
of uncleanliness and of lewdness leading more lawlessness so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness for when we were slaves of sin you were free in regards to righteousness what fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed for the end of those things is death but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves to god you have the fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life what a greater reward because the wages of sin is death but the gift of god is eternal life through christ jesus our lord leave us you're interrupting our prophet i can't give to you lord i have to give to other things i can't support your kingdom because i have to support my children Leave me, Lord. I don't want that because I like my lifestyle. I love doing the things that I do. I love going on Sundays to Disneyland. Leave me, Lord. I'm not going to come and worship you. You can go in the trunk. Yeah, that's what they were saying. They are slaves to unrighteousness, not slaves to righteousness. Jesus has come for us. And he's come for us to have a personal relationship with him so that he becomes our master. And so 12 guys who are standing by watching all this are going, whoa, I'm getting this now. I'm getting this completely. Jesus just delivered these two men from these demonic forces. And this town just rejected them. Wow, how they reject righteousness and embrace unrighteousness and the things of this world. He has come to set us free and set us free indeed. What can we learn from this passage? One, that we have a foe, an enemy, who is real and he's out there and we need to be aware of him and we need to be praying, not fighting physically, but praying on our knees because we don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against powers and principalities of the air and so we need to be on our knees. And then what we need to do is serve righteousness. We need to just let God love through us. Let God reveal his son and his grace through us so that people would see that he's there. And then they make the decision whether they want to reject you or receive you, whether they want to reject Christ or accept Christ Jesus. That's their decision. Our application is to walk before them and before the Lord Jesus Christ. Some application. Um, Another application can be that we need to be totally sold out for Christ, right? Be totally sold out for him because we're slaves to something. And so I'd rather be a slave to Christ. I can ask the worship group to come on up here. We'll partake of communion with one another. <clears throat> Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And though there is some interesting points here on demonic possessions and actions that uh, we can see clearly lord in in the spiritual realm father the the point lord is the love of god that he loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life lord that's the point lord there is god's grace even to those who are demonically possessed father even to those lord who have probably dabbled in the occult father and, and and are suffering the repercussions of it lord and, and and lord because of their decision making lord they're 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 reaping what they sow lord and we come along and we judge them even more lord no jesus came to free them and offer them hope help us to be like jesus lord trying to find the hope through the whole situation we thank you lord for the opportunities father that you give us, Father, when people will receive us. I thank you for the opportunity, Lord, that we get to embrace our mother-in-law where we have not been able to for years. And now because they've allowed us to, Lord, we're embracing her and hoping that, Lord, she'll come to know you as a personal Savior, Lord. We thank you for those opportunities, Lord. It's only by your grace and your mercies, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
I can have the ushers come forward as they're playing this song, that we prepare our hearts before the Lord to receive communion in His presence. spirit's desire father i'm sure in all of our hearts lord forgive us lord when our flesh desires other things lord help us lord uh, we are weak lord and we need your strength and power and more grace lord god to be poured upon us father lord as we partake now lord we we confess father our faults and our sins before you lord forgive us father in the name of jesus lord and we partake now of the body and of the blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who willfully gave his body and his blood for us, Lord, because he loved us, Lord. And so he died on the cross because of that love, Lord. Uh, he allowed men to, to abuse him, Lord, and reject him because of his love for us here, Lord. And even the separation of his father, Lord, was because of his love and because he wanted us to be united with his Father. So we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Go ahead and eat the, the body. And drink the cup. God bless you. Uh, don't go looking for demons in every place, <laughs> but look for the opportunity uh, to see uh, God's grace be poured into someone. God bless you.